bad, yeah, it's all good. Um, how was this, how was the chess game? Did you win? Oh, you oh, didn't win. So, I've been playing chess, and I've been playing twenty-minute games because ten-minute games are they rush you. So it is by no means a demonstration of your chess ability. It's like trying to I, I like trying to say like play a football match, but you've only got thirty seconds. Like it's not it's not a football match, is it? I don't know. Yeah, I don't think you should it, like. If you're playing casually, I think you you shouldn't have a time limit. You shouldn't put a time limit on well, things. I think 20 minutes is quite nice because it doesn't really come into play. And it, it kind of says like, okay, I'm not going to sit there and give, wait 10 minutes for the next move. Because there are some people who might play a game of week, a game of chess over a week. Like, yeah. So, um, but... Oh, God. So I've been playing my brother recently because he's just started. And I've beaten him four times in a row, I think. Oh, but he's getting well pissed off with that. Yeah, and he's, <laughs> pra- he's, he's practicing. And, uh, oh, God. We've been doing 20-minute games. And I sent him, he said he was playing today. And uh, he uh, invited me. And he invited me to a 10-minute one. And I sent him a 20-minute invite. And I thought, oh, he's not going to accept the 20 minute. I know he's going to want to do 10 minutes. So yeah. I was like, all right, fine, I'll do it. Yeah. Got my rum and coke as well, sat here. Um, oh, what? So. Oh, I'm going to have to do one of those again and go get a whiskey. Well. It's going to be a drunk episode. <laughs> I don't know. You're. You, you're never prepared. Like, you should have sensed the vibe. Dude, well, um, I, I didn't I even talk to Ivan. Oh, God. All right. Okay, right. Well, you can go and get a drink. But firstly, let me explain what happened with chess, just, okay. to, sum up, just to sum it up. So I played him for the fifth time today. And we got down to, like, I think I had about one minute left and he still had two minutes left. Because I was playing time at the start, and then I was just thinking to myself, I can checkmate him. I know I can get there. Yeah. And a couple of moves here, there, or later, I had enough there. Like his king was pinned, and I just had all these pieces around him. And I was like, I had like seconds left, and he had time. So he was he was changing sort of like every 40 seconds he'd make a move. And then I had to, in a mini second, know what I was going to do and make that move to make sure the time didn't run out. And I was dancing around the board, yeah. And oh my God, my heart was just going <laughs> for it because it was on the line, you know. I couldn't lose this chess game. And fuck me, the time ran out. And I swear, I, if I had if I'd had 30 seconds more, I could have done it. But the whole point is, is I looked at my analytics afterwards. I made 13 blunders in that chess game. Jeez. And it's like, that's a different game. And I'm not saying that it's not a game of chess. It's, it's a variation, but it's a volatile variation. And I don't think it reflects my chess ability. So it's 4-1, I guess. But like, we'll give him half a point for it. But he still thinks he's won, obviously. He texted me straight after my phone went, woohoo! <laughs> and uh, by that time, I just went and sat on the sofa with my head in her hands. Aww. And uh, Claudia came in. She saw me on the sofa, like, curled in the bush. She was like, what's wrong? And I looked up at her and I was like, I lost. <laughs> You'll get him next time, I'm sure. Yeah, we got to play again. We had a little time when we were playing. It's all inspired by, uh, what's it called? The Queen's Gambit. And I play that as an opening. I'm so cliche. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, dear. Have you seen the um, the opening that um, Magnuson did? I can't remember who he played against, but um, he was playing as white and he said... Um, I sometimes I like to play um a a what is it a three or a four pawn so the rook on the queen side so the mm. left hand side 
And he said, it's the most useless move. It doesn't do anything for you. Like, it's basically just giving the the play to black, giving the advantage to black because it's such a, a, like, a useless move. Mm. Um, I'll try and send you the link later, but it's quite interesting. But it throws them off or something. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I can imagine. Um, let me go and get this whiskey. All right, because I need to get my... What have I got? I might even have something nice, a little treat. Ah, oh, a little treat as well. Have you got chocolate? Uh, I might have a Maltesers chocolate oh, bunny. Oh, no! I've got a Maltesers got chocolate nothing. bunny. I've, do you know what? I, when I was shopping, um, there were five for £2.50, no, five for £2.40 or 50p each, and I purposefully bought four. Just to throw their data off, because it's like <laughs> what? it's like. What do you mean, throw their data off? Well, all of them that they're perfectly trying to price it so that you think to yourself, "Oh, I'll just buy five. But I was only saving ten p by doing so, and I thought to myself, "I'm not, I'm not, I'm not complying. That's not enough." <laughs> Wait, so what's the deal again? What was the deal? The deal was five chocolate bunnies for for two pound forty. Five chocolate bunnies for two. Like, two like what do you mean, chocolate bunnies? Well, you know the Maltese are chocolate bunnies. Oh, the small little things. Yeah, Not, yeah. And I think they've dropped in size, but we can talk about we'll that. We'll talk later. about that later. There's quite a few things I want to talk yeah. about. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a topic of the week. Um, so yeah, I've got four of them, and I got them for what two pounds. So the last one I would have saved ten p on. What's that? Not even half a bunny here. <laughs> Go and get your drink. I need to get my thing as well. Be right back. Um, so this is... I've got um, whiskey on the rocks. Three ice cubes. Um, the only reason why I put three in is because I poured a bit too much whiskey out. Um, so by the end of this, it, you know, I might be a bit... Um, bit half cooked um so it's just whiskey on its own oh yeah just whiskey on its own yeah yeah got to appreciate it um i wish i could get to that point with rum is that a bit would rum be really weird on its own rum is a bit yeah it's a bit weird on its own i mean you can spiced spiced rum whiskey is um i like whiskey as well actually to be fair yeah whiskey's nice austin got me into whiskey but anyway, I think um, I think we're doing a good thing here by drinking uh, with the coronavirus because it's almost sanitising your throat, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, I've been doing it purposefully because of that. So, so all the alcoholics in the world, cheers! You know, what's a funny thing is when I'm uh, looking at houses on Right Move, I see quite a lot of them have bars. Oh, yeah, everyone loves a nice little bar, don't they? Yeah, that's like, what does that say? Oh, come through to my bar. <laughs> yeah, come through to my bar, let's do business. Train wreck. Unless, obviously, it's like a mansion. Then maybe you have a bar. Then maybe. You have a, you have a whole separate room, like a gentleman's room. With like You yeah. know, there's gentleman chairs and uh, smoke inside with cigars and stuff. But then who are we to say you can't have a bar? Who are we? Tim and Woody. Well, Woody and Tim. Cue the music. Welcome to the Just Swimcast, the show entirely devoted to something, something. Um, what was it? Um, furthering our species through talk and discussion. There we go. My name's Woody. And I'm Tim. Um, also, we should also do this bit where we say, um, if you've been here f for this video, you've clicked on it, it'd be nice if you could like, comment and subscribe, <laughs> um, hit them early, hit them early. Um, we got a new, um, subscriber. We're at 11 now. And I think I know who that is. 
No, 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 no. Don't ruin it because if we know who it is, then it means it's someone within our circle. No, not and necessarily. We need, to, we need. We've been discussing. We need to set. We need to take wind and and find something. Uh, some cherubs on the other land. But continue. Well, this. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you offline about who it is. Well, um, anyway, new subscriber. Thank you. Anyway, new subscriber. Uh, we've got a lot of views, had a lot of views on uh, all the other platforms. Uh, I can see that people have appreciated Apple Music, which is good to see. Um, I do have some topics. Um, do you have any topics to start with? Because my ones, they may go in pretty deep, it's like straight from the off start, and I'm not sure I really want to do that. So, Well, let's make it... Um... Let's start off with the current and talk about today with Boris Johnson. So we haven't covered politics too much. Um, it's quite a political time in the, the UK. The Blonde Mop Mayor or the Blonde Mop PM Yeah, now. which would be perfectly placed to pay right now if if Holly was all right with it. Um, I'll do a little snippet. Yeah, but... Oh, I almost I just googled his name earlier and it went on his Wikipedia and it just shocked me that we're even in this place because I remember as a kid growing up when he was the mayor with my granddad I think we went to go and see some sort of royal parade and for some reason he was walking along or involved at the time with it because he was the mayor of London I think but yeah. this was, I was quite no nah, he can't have been the mayor of London because that was recent No it wasn't recent that was uh... It was when I was younger 24 when was it 2012 to 2016 maybe somewhere around there yeah sort of mid 10s but even then imagining that this guy is going to be prime minister um is quite interesting but my my granddad i think he actually said to me at the time um he'll be pm one day no nah, he said watch out the people love him but it's all fake <laughs> yeah he knew so, didn't he uh interesting uh but here we are today and he has done his apology over the shocking death toll of a hundred thousand uk coronavirus deaths well it, yeah here and here's the other interesting news which i discovered the other day i think i've sent you a link to it um apparently some general practices nhs general practices gps have been throwing away vaccines at the end of the day because they weren't able to get the people in to take them. Yeah, but I have also heard in contrast to that that they do have, um, at the end of the day, apparently at some places you can queue up and if there are leftover ones, they will let you in. Well, yeah, so that that's, so, that's what the news was. So, yeah, but I, do, you, do you see what I said? I think it's I think it's to do with the fact maybe they can't administer it after x amount of like expiry date i'm not sure and it is that that but the the thing is but that's the thing is the pfizer vaccine is like that isn't it that's the weakness of it is the fact that the transportation and delivery of it is difficult like uh administration of it yeah um but the, the, the problem Storage. is is this is from the news that i've read and i can't verify any of it um so people go and do your own verification but my understanding is is the guidance that GPs were given given from above, i.e. from government, was essentially to do that. Otherwise, it, like throw them away. Otherwise, we will cut off your supply chain, like cut off your supply of vaccines. Mm. So some GPs have been scared to not throw them away because they think, well, we're not going to get any more vaccines. Like it's just like the corruption in this country is unbelievable. I think that I've always been like, you know, I'm a little bit conspiracy, yeah. But mm. I do actually think that like the UK, well, England and London in particular is like this just You know, you get those countries that are like special for licenses and all these weird things. Yeah, like we're Gibraltar one of those and other things. We're like that, but like Criminal. not for licenses. It's just like I don't even know. Yes. People I think we just get flushed like a wet flannel. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, I've got a, a bit of a public service announcement to make. 
about um, sardines. It's a bit of a weird one. But me and my dad were in the kitchen today. Every day we have um, sardines on toast. Dad makes his own sourdough. You have sardines on toast every day? Yeah. Around 12 o'clock, half past 12. Oh, sardine time. Sardine, yes, that's what we call it, sardine time. Oh, are they like oily in the tin when you get them out? No, we get the ones in tomato sauce. It's really nice. You are, you're not going to like it because you like, you know, fish really food. Google this shit. Sardines in tomato sauce. But anyway, here's the public service announcement. Um, it says on the front of the sardine tin um, something like, a good source of omega-3, which is, like, supposed to be good good for you, like, good oily fats that are good for your gut and good for your health and things like that. But Dad went up to Tesco, the, li- the little Tesco, and he couldn't find any sardines in tomato sauce. Obviously, a lot of people are eating sardines in tomato sauce. So he got mackerel instead, mackerel in tomato sauce, tinned mackerel. So today we compared them because we had a tin of sardines here and it turns out that mackerel, the tinned mackerel, has more omega-3, like basically double the amount of omega-3 in it than the sardines. However, the mackerel tin doesn't have the little sticker saying a good source of omega-3. So something fishy is going on here. With people, like, they're trying to sell sardines more than mackerel. I don't know what it is yet, but probably next time we come, next time we do a podcast, I'll figure out the reason. I'll try and find some dirty um, black market stuff that's going on and try and reveal the full truth. But there we go. If you're looking for a high source of omega-3, get the tin mackerel. I hear that tin salmon is even higher in omega-3. So we may migrate to that um, fish later and it will be salmon time rather than uh, sardine time. So talking of fish, fish is an undiscovered world for me Mm. food-wise. I have an allergy to salmon. Um, I have an allergy to a few other things as well, but fish-wise, it's salmon. Um, I had a reaction when I was 10 maybe. Mm Mm-hmm. And it wasn't as severe as my others, some of my others, but it was still enough to make me not want to eat fish or yeah. salmon in particular. Other fish just sort of makes me feel like grimbly afterwards, like not having a good time. Mm. But, for example, when we went to Indonesia, we were on the beach and there's this like humongous outlay of fish food, like straight from the sea, yeah. And uh, it just, I feel like I'm just missing out on so much. You are. You honestly yeah, are. Yeah, I know. But the thing is, is that I have to, I have to like, I think when I'm like 30, when I've got time and I can like travel a bit and stuff like that. I don't think I, that happens. I, I think that's a fallacy, Tim. Well, right, when I'm 40 then. I think 50. that's a fallacy. I don't think When that, I'm 50. I think it's now. The time is now. What, to start eating fish? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do like cod, but that's just fish and chips. That's just simple. It still so makes it, me feel horrible after, but I oh, like it. Does. Him. Yeah. White fish is fine, genuinely. Maybe it's the omega 3s then. Maybe it's um, cause maybe it's that. Yeah. Um, that's weird, though, because whatever omega 3 is, like apparently it's good for you. I'm not getting I'm much d- of I that. I don't know. I, I'm just saying. It yeah, could... but I'm not getting much of that. Like, I'm yeah, just you're not getting any of it. Doesn't run with omega three. We have quite a lot of fish in um, yeah. in our house. Obviously, Maybe we have I sardines. Buy some every of those day. little supplement things. Hmm. Oh, I wouldn't dig too deep into it. Well, um, should probably go to like a doctor. Well, not at the moment because you don't want to catch Rona. But um... so the thing about Rona, okay, is it kind of has changed, like just everything like even down to the smallest things like the way that you look at a door handle or 
the way you like navigate around public spaces, the way you walk down the street, the way everyone is. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that my level of how much I do that, like, so for example, for ages and ages, I remember looking back at the start of coronavirus when it wasn't that bad, but there was so much fear tactic out there, like everyone talking about, Arr! I was like wearing my mask and like gloves going around the flat that I live in, like not, not the flat that I live in, I mean the communal building, yeah. Mm-hmm. But now that I understand that they're a bit more like open airway, the hallways and stuff like that, I now just walk around without a mask. And then when I get downstairs or when I get to Sainsbury's, I then put the mask on. Do you know what I mean? So I guess the interesting thing is, is that now time has gone by. Coronavirus is worse, but my level of care for it is just like falling Reduce. away. Yeah. And isn't that kind of lockdown in a way, in the sense that lockdown has these opposite reactions to you? Like, eventually it just, you can't keep going with it. Do well, you know what I mean? yeah, I mean, that was, um, that's kind of it. I think, I think I mentioned that in the previous podcast, like eventually people are just going to not care. Like they just, it doesn't matter about what, what restrictions the government says. Like people just, are just they're just not going to care. And just going to go and do stuff. Yeah. And it's not like the police could even do anything about it because there aren't any police. Like over the past eight years, the conservatives have just reduced police numbers. So it's not as as if there's like, like I don't, I, I haven't seen a police officer. We put up with a lot, don't we? Like in terms of like, think of what, not this government in general, think of the previous like governments we've had. Mm. As like, the general public, we have put up with a lot. That's a nice interruption. Oh, no. Still glowing about chess. <laughs> oh, um, turned off. Um, we, have, we have put up with a lot of, a lot of stuff from the government. Um, it, basically, that they don't do anything. Or they, 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 they do what I wish software developers would do. They remove things, the government, and they don't add any value, but they remove value. Do you know what was happening in uh, the ETH development chat today? No, I don't. I'll tell you. So they were discussing this thing that Vitalik, the owner of Ethereum and the main like guy behind it all, um, he wanted to add something on top of a problem that was basically in the platform, yeah. That was oh, to... band-aids on band-aids. He wanted to deploy a new thing okay. in ignorance of the fact that there was a problem behind it, yeah. Okay. That's a typ- typical a, software developer, that is. A lot of the developers were like, you can't well, do that. Why don't we just tackle this problem here now? And... uh yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. I wanted your view on that. Like, what do you think? I haven't seen it, um, so I don't know the context. So I'd be able to give a much better... No, I mean, in general, what is your... Like, so when you have a problem, do you think it's normally good to... I know it varies, but, like, I guess you can't answer it, maybe. So, um, I can answer it. It's... The, the benefit that Ethereum Foundation has is that they are a foundation, which means they're not accountable or responsible for any profit or loss uh, situations. Um, So they don't have somebody beating down on them saying, where's my new features? Where's my new features? Uh, Because I need to make money. Obviously, the community's like that, but again, they're a foundation. Like, nobody cares. Like, if they don't do anything, they don't do anything. Um. In the corporate or in the like private company world and public as well, public sectors, um, there are problems in things that they're just too expensive to solve and it's best to just put a plaster over them. Um, it's annoying. Everybody that everybody hates the idea of putting a plaster on it. 
but ultimately you need to make money and fixing the problem isn't going to make you more money it's just going to cost more money do you know what i mean have i answered that question correctly i don't know i think so it's progress for like the sake of progress over yeah yeah um, i mean that makes sense uh, another thing was that um i noticed that because they're a decentralized team and they're quite a big team it looked like it was quite difficult to I, I don't i'm not surprised that maybe they struggle at times because there's a guy leading it which he seemed like he was doing a great job but another guy sort of raised this problem of um it was almost the levels to, to which the standard of the code was written in appreciation of previous principles that the code had been built on uh -huh. and that contracts work on and it was to do with i think the execution of a contract and where even a contract goes wrong, it self terminates. Okay. Uh -huh. And they were, he was saying how, like, we need to actually go through this and properly set out ways of how we're going to do this and stick to them moving forward. Because if we don't have a certain level or a law written for that, then everything we do is kind of pointless because we're not getting the right sort of thing at the end. Mm and um then one guy was like yeah i think that's not a set that's like a, not a conversation for now we need to just put that aside and have that at a separate point and then they all sort of put their hands up who was going to talk about that as a separate point but didn't actually ever really resolve it and the guy was just sort of shut down and it was like i don't know yeah see this is um this is the problem with, with the big corporate structure in a way like, it's, I feel no, like it's this isn't this isn't um, a lot of people in one room maybe i don't know yeah it's that it's the because it's a foundation there's a lack of governance a lack of strong governance um there's a lot of ideas on the, on the table and nobody can nobody's there to make a decision um a lot of open source things are like this a lot of open source projects are have this problem um or in some cases are the other way and they're completely uh, owned by somebody that doesn't want to do anything like somebody questions something and they go well i built it so i'm going to do it like this um it is a big problem and they won't they won't be able to do anything about it um I think I don't know if if Ethereum is open source, is it? Like, can anyone submit a pull request? I don't know. Maybe they can. The thing is, is that you can, but then whoever runs the project is just going to go, no, I don't like that. Even if it is good for, there's no, there's a lack of governance basically. Ideally, what happens is when the um, what they need is a pro product manager, basically, like a community product manager. I think but, they kind of have that. Yeah. They need to be able to understand the project and what people want. But at the same time, you need so, somebody that knows infrastructure well. Because it, this is like essentially what they're building. They need Tim Berners-Lee, I think. So for people that don't know, Tim Berners-Lee is the guy that basically built the internet. Like He built the protocols that we now run our lives on. Um, you think about like how like, the internet hasn't changed since it was invented back in whenever it was, the late 60s or early 70s. The infrastructure hasn't changed. It's just scaled. And it's look how well it's scaled. So they, they need somebody that, like Tim Berners, that has Tim Berners-Lee's mind to own decisions about Ethereum. And those people don't exist anymore. Like those types of people, they don't exist. Vitalik is not that person. He's a good programmer, but that's it. He's not a critical thinker like Tim Berners-Lee is, not that that level. So it's interesting you bring up the governance side of things because a recent thing in cryptocurrency is to have a governance token whereby you issued this token and you can use it um, or the amount of tokens that you have gives you governance in the platform, the protocol. Uh, Uniswap is an example of this. 
and they hold votes, community votes, where you make a decision, you sign on the blockchain, your opinion on it, mm -hmm. and then they vote. And then once consensus is achieved, the devs do that or yeah. whatever needs to be done is achieved. Mm -hmm. So the weird thing about this is, is a lot of the time you see community members in cryptocurrency always suggesting ideas to the project. And I obviously work in a position where I'm on the other side of those suggestions. And I think that from the outside, it always looks so simple as to what a currency or a cryptocurrency, a token, uh, a project, a product, whatever it is. Yep. It always seems so simple to point out what they should do. Yep. And I do it myself. I look at coin market cap, um, looking at all the different cryptocurrencies, like some for when I used to do like buying them and selling them and stuff. But some of them, I just look at the projects just to see what the technology is and to get an idea on it. And, uh, even I find myself like, oh, they could do this or that. because like it, the, one thing I've realized in product is like it takes you a while to realize the easiest thing to do is to think about product ideas and to think about what you could do. Um, and I think it's weird when you're a community member because you almost you feel like so frustrated. Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing this? And the reality is it's like some of the things we are doing, some of the things they might be doing some of the things they might have looked at, but they know won't work. And quite frankly, when you're running a company, there's also that as well. Like running a company is its own thing as well. It's not just the ideas of what yeah. the user might want all of the time, even though it should be. It doesn't always work out like that. Yeah. Um, so especially that's... with politics inside of workplace and stuff like that. Yeah, well, what you've defined there, what you've like highlighted there is basically what a product owner should be. They should be the voice of the users. Um, going to, so that's something that um, that Austin's good at, which is understanding with by using data and talking to people, like talking to actual users, like what do they want, and then going to stakeholders and saying. Our users don't want a button that links out to Pinterest with a board of what the marketing team have done about, oh, this is a new, this is a crypto yeah. board. What they want is so, they want to be able to pay for their fucking whatever. Um, so, so let's do that. So the thing is, though, is I, I appreciate he probably is good at it. And I know there are people who are better and worse at it. But there's also the problem of, like, how do you go about that outreach? How many consumer or community members or trial testers can you get that aren't incentivized to complete a test and to give you information or it depends on the yeah you're it's a, it's you a see, tough question like, if i ask in my job if i ask community members what do they think of something like some of them might suggest let's do this to inflate the token price to make the share value go up essentially. Mm -hmm. um, same as if you asked a share investor in a company, what should we do? Uh, make more money. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's almost, it's almost, it's weird. It's, it's a weird position to be in. Like, I know you need feedback, but feedback is, is hard to find. It is, but you have to, so you're right. P people don't know. People will give the answer that they obviously, they, they want. Um, but it's the job of the product owner, product manager to build hypotheses first before asking for feedback. So they would be involved with, you know, the community, what people are saying, and then building up hypothesis with data that they've already got and talking to people in the you know the telegram channel or whatever discord channel yeah um then once they've got a consensus so this is so this isn't actually in a big corporate world someone like emirates emirates airlines they would have people called uh, ux researchers user experience researchers they they know how to get valuable information about what users want 
from the people that use their their service product whatever and it's a it's a skill that not many people in the world have and they earn quite a bit of money so if anyone wants to you know help companies build products especially now then become a ux researcher i think um that's what they do and then they feed that to the product manager they often come with ideas as well about like they've built up a hypothesis they've got the research from the customers um they go to the pm and say look this is what's going on in our community and our users our customers um like is this a legit thing like is there anything that we can do about this is does the data show this as well and the pm will take that go away find the data for it if they believe that it's true they would ask the ux researcher to you know come up with some ideas if they haven't already to go to a stakeholder and say look we have spoken to our customers we have the data that shows that they are correct we should be doing this we shouldn't be doing what you want to do because nobody wants what you want to do um, but it's very difficult to be in a business that's like that no that there are very few businesses that have that ideal product driven um world and it's the same with ethereum they don't know what people want they don't know how bad their software is they don't know that a virtual machine is the worst thing to have they don't know that using golang whatever they don't they don't know these things all they know is that they've built this java like system that is terrible and they they've whatever i'm just saying that because i actually i don't actually know but um and i can't really remember where i was going with that but that's my answer to getting feedback from people and what it should actually do in the business and it is very difficult i've not been able to do it successfully what is your favorite thing about working in product Um, and then also maybe your least favorite. It's an interesting question because I don't, it's, it's the only, like, I don't necessarily, I, I enjoy problem solving. That's what I enjoy. I enjoy problem solving and I enjoy, um, and this goes back to what we were talking about in the first podcast, I think, which is. I like building things, you know, and like you release a, a feature or release a new product, um, like an app or something or a website, and it feels good. Like you can look at it and you go, wow, people are actually like using it and I'm, I'm getting feedback on it and there's people, like I've got a thousand downloads on the app store. Um, it's the sense of it's the problem solving and the feeling of accomplishment that you've actually changed something in the world like I know like finance people do and operations people do but I feel like it's something that's a bit less visible like it's only visible internally whereas what we do in product is visible externally yeah I think that's a fair point and the thing that I dislike about it most is and I, which is something that you're more exposed to in product just because it's product um is the politics um, everybody wants to be a product owner everyone everyone thinks they're a product owner everyone thinks they can do what we do um and they just can't you know, it's it's very easy. Like, and but the, the thing that I hate most about it is, I can say that I can do their job too. Uh, you know, I I could sit there on a spreadsheet and do finance all day if I wanted, but I don't tell them how to do it. I could do marketing. You know, digital marketing. I could edit videos, edit audio, be a um, a, a, what are they called? I mean, marketing isn't really a thing anymore. All they are are project managers that get that outsource all of the marketing work to agencies. They're just middlemen. I could do that, but I don't tell them how to do it. 
And that's what happens in product meetings is everybody tells you what you should be doing. And it's very difficult to say no. We should know, like, you don't come prepared with all the answers. But I never go into a meeting that's not about me and say, well, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you know, to a marketing person. I don't think people in product are like that. Yeah. That's what I hate about it. I hate politics. Yeah, I think they were uh, very astute observations. I think everyone feels the same thing probably in product. Some people love the politics. Some people love it. Um, but most people that I've met in product, they hate it. They hate the politics side. What what they love is problem solving and accomplished like seeing something go up, you know. Being in product is amazing because you get so much access to it. You get basically access to the entire business. Like people in operations don't know how much money the company's making, but people in product do because they have access to the database and they can just do a quick query on all the sales done in the last year and work out how much. Like you have so much power as a product owner to just go in and look at stuff. Yet nobody listens to you. Even if you tell them, look, we had this last year. We should be doing this. Yeah, I know, but yeah, where, did, where did you get that data from? Uh, whatever, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, there's a problem in the world. You need to, don't, don't, don't shout in your mic. Sorry, sorry. I was trying to do the opposite. I was trying to lower my voice, not even to speak as loud. Is it too loud now? It's fine. So there's a problem in the world. Mm -hmm. Things are getting smaller. Things are getting smaller, man. So I'll, t I'll give you a story, right? I When I did my shopping, whenever I did my shopping last, I needed to buy toilet paper. And I went to the toilet to do a number two. And I reached over for the toilet paper. I ripped off the required amount of sheets and I folded it in my hand and I thought either my hands got bigger <laughs> or this paper's got thinner in every single dimension. <laughs> it's got narrower, shorter and thinner sheets and I've paid the same amount of money for it. I've never re so this is it right so you've got inflation which is where your money buys less and then you've got desization yeah, which is desization. the desization of food of cream eggs and mm. of everything that matters mm. and I will not stand for it any longer <laughs> it's gone on long enough I like are my grandkids going to eat a green keg this like a cream egg the same size as a mini egg yeah i think so uh, and that, that, and they do exist actually and and it gets more expensive. A cream yeah. egg's almost a pound now. It's ridiculous. I tell you what, um go about cream eggs, the they sell the boxes of cream eggs. Um they used to be six in a pack. Now there's like probably five and now there's bouncing, five. They're all bouncing whoa, around whoa, whoa, cracked too and, they're all sorry, they're all bouncing around, cracked and smashed off each other. I'm gonna adjust my game. Yeah. Um They're yeah, they're it's it's a nightmare. I don't know. Just bump it up a tiny bit. So what are we going to do about it? I don't think there's nothing you can do about it. It's just toilet paper's getting well, smaller. Eventually, no, you just, all you're going to get is you're going to get like a roll that's about the width of your two fingers, just enough to like you know. So should just, there not be a like consumer protection against that? Like a guy who sits How there. How do you do that? <laughs> nah, this is it. I'm the cream egg guy. And every year it gets to a day and I know, just like when you get called into the courts to be your, uh, on the jury or something like that, yeah. you know that today is the day where you're going to compare the size of a cream egg from last year, which you've been asked to look after. You look at it, you're like, yep, yeah, that's the same size. And then you see the price and you're like, and then you give it a score. But you can't do that. That's the whole idea of capitalism, right? You can't just um, you can't have laws that prevent the companies would just go out of business because the reason why they've done like especially chocolate and cream eggs. Like um, here's another example, which is the um, I think they're 110 grams now 
or maybe 109 gram bar of Cadbury's chocolate, just like the one you had the other day where it was the fruit and nut one, but just the plain one. They're about a pound usually or £1.50. Uh, I never get them at £1.50. But they used to be like 120 grams, I'm pretty sure, or like 150 grams or something like that. Yeah. The but, Cadbury's one was always 150. I remember that. 150, yeah. And, and now was, they've dropped and they've dropped. They're like four rows thick or something, aren't they? No, they're still the same rows and, and columns. So it's the same number. They're just oh, smaller. thinner. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thinner. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, right. But the reason yeah, why they did that yeah, okay. is because the government introduced a sugar tax and Cadbury's didn't want to increase their price. Yeah. So instead they reduced the chocolate. So I think it's, yeah, I, I don't think it's the, I don't think you can put any legislation in to prevent companies from doing that because they also need to survive. What but you the need other is side a, to it yeah. is the, the dilution. So I said to you the other day, what if every year with from concentrate juices, they just take the ratio up just a tiny percent and then like bit by bit, you always think you're having the same apple juice, but slowly they're taking that apple juice away from you. The concentrate, reducing the amount of concentrate. To the point where in the future, like everything... Like you buy paint and it's just grey, different shades of grey. Yeah. You have food and it's just different shades of just nothingness, just sponge. <laughs> because you've just like choice has just been taken from you. The choice of flavour. Yeah. Um So this is uh, but so I've never actually looked into too much, like I've always said I hate capitalism and everything like that. But I was looking on YouTube at all these different things like communism, Marxism, capitalism, and like their definitions and things like that the other day. And like it's so weird that we have these like just these are the three these are the ways of doing things. This is what everyone says like I don't know. There are some places in the world that um that don't that have different things. Um, I can't. Remember, I can't remember. I'll have to bring it next episode with me. I need to prepare for that that one. Um, but I've got a topic that's been put in by one of our viewers. Oh, for real! I was yeah. going to start asking for those. Um, it's quite a deep one, but I think we're there. I think we're in, in that part of the conversation now. Um, they they, they haven't quite worded it as a question as such but i think it might be something that you've probably thought about and i've definitely thought about um so I, i'll just read out what what they said and we'll take it from there so they said they would like us to discuss how minor or major events conversation acts of positive reinforcement whatever can be incredibly influential to a child like a tiny moment in their childhood might shift the entire direction or pathway that that person goes down for the rest of their life. Um, and how a lot of things we do slash how we act are taken from people that played a big part in our life. Does that make sense? Yep. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I think we kind of touched upon this a little bit once. Um, but definitely I think that you you take things from people that are around you when you're growing up. I think you lean on that massively and it shapes who you are. I think it's a bit... Um, see, I think we... So here, here's something that I saw on the interwebs the other day. Um, I think it was like some cheesy little Facebook post or whatever. Um, it wasn't cheesy. It was quite serious, actually. But it was saying something like, if you don't listen to your child when they're young, like, you know, maybe your child 
comes over to you and says, Daddy, Daddy, look at this. Like, blah, and they're just talking at you. They're not actually saying anything, but they're just talking at you. Um, and maybe you're not listening because you know what they're saying is just like a load of bollocks. Hmm. But it was saying that if you don't listen to them at that age, then how can you expect them to tell you anything later on in life? Hmm. I think that's quite powerful that like, well, because ch uh, children's brains are like sponges, aren't they? You know, yeah. they're, they're a heightened level of, they have to absorb so much to fit but in I the world. I question the statement. Do they need to tell you anything when they're older? Like, uh, I, I, I kind of get it. I, I get the, I, I think there are definitely pivotal interactions that you have with a child when they're young. And I think that every conversation matters. Every behavior matters. Yeah. I think you have to try your best at all times. And I think that, being a parent, I say even myself, I think that's like one of the hardest things, especially about lockdown. One of the hardest things is like, like, because a lot of the time through the day, like the best thing about lockdown is that I can walk past the sofa, like say if I'm going into the bedroom after sitting on my laptop for a bit and Miyako sat there on the sofa, like playing or whatever. And I just like dive on her and give her a cuddle. And it's mm. great. Like yeah. it's so good. But then there's also the other time where like, um, you know, colleagues messaging me at work about like what the password is for our social media accounts or something yeah and i'm trying to like get the password up log into my security safe password thing get all that stuff and then miyaka comes over and she's like um oh i just wanted to show you this i wanted to show you this and you're yeah. like oh but hang on just one minute just one minute whereas in reality like when i always look back on it I don't need to reply to that person at work right now. I can give her that one minute and go and look at whatever she's made. Of course, the reality is, is that it's not one minute. When she shows me the boat that she's made in her bedroom, she'll want me to play in it and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And it's like drawing that line of like, okay, um, like even when you're playing with her, you're dragged away thinking, okay, I can play with her now, but in five, ten minutes, I'm going to have to sort of like focus attention on something she can do a bit more on her own. Yeah. Um, and it's it's kind of horrible, but it's kind of like I was thinking when you first started saying this about like a lioness with a cub, like picking it up in its mouth and just taking it away and just being like, dude, we've got to go and do stuff. Yeah. And it's kind of like at that point, it's like we kind of had to just get through this and do stuff. And the biggest worry for me is that, yes, these interactions are important. And I know Miyako like my daughter in particular is very confident and very on the wild side on the wild card side i'd say um she's not like a lot of her friends that we've seen in the past of her same age are a bit more reserved mm -hmm. and i always think with being on the wild side of things like it's a volatility in personality and obviously when you always want your kid like you you feel like you're rolling the dice and you i guess the sad part of it is that you want it to be a good reflection of yourself. But then the loving part is actually that you want the best for the kid as well. So you want that kid to be a certain way. And it's difficult because you worry about it all the time. You worry if lockdown and all this is going to like, think about going back to coronavirus. Yeah. It's like, sometimes we'll say about going for a walk or going to the park or doing something or something. Yeah. And Miyako will say, well, is it safe because of coronavirus? And, that's kind of a problem of when if the lockdown first started, if Miyako wanted to go and do something or asked us, we'd have to, we said to her, no, we it's can't not safe, yeah. because, um, and like Claudia would try and explain, or I would try and explain, like say, because of there's this thing called the coronavirus. But then in reality, it's like, I see her now, like when we go out of the door together, there's another door we have to go out. And she waits by the front door. She doesn't touch the door. She knows she can't touch the door. She waits for me to open the door. She goes through. There's another door. She knows that I have to open the door for her. She waits there. Yeah. Like she's coronavirus trained and she's four. Yeah. That's kind of sad, like, isn't it? Yeah, it is kind of sad. Yeah. And at nursery, like they were sanitizing all of their hands and she's got eczema on her hands. And like um, the people like at nursery, they just don't. Anyway, it's, yeah, it's very difficult. Um, so I've got a question that kind of leads on to this that might help. Um, 
the 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 main like the main point of this was there any was there a per, a person or a figure or a character in a in a book or a film that when you was younger maybe from the years 8 to 16 that you thought like that you kind of idolized not idolized but you thought I want to kind of be like that person I did but I'm wondering if you do if you did um I think I had my stepdad and then I had like certain friends I think like my stepdad I'd kind of slowly pick up things that I wanted to be like over time and then certain friends I would think like I wanted to be like them or be a certain way mm. um which I don't think I was like I don't think I was like super superficial and fake him in that way I think I was more like not wanting to be them but wanting the freedom that they had um just the their lives were quite different to mine a lot mm. of them especially how their parents were and like the fact they could just go out and do whatever they wanted and like not have this expectation. Like I've, I've always had quite an expectation, I think in a way in our family to just do stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is good. But then, yeah. So for me, when I was probably 13 through to 15, maybe a bit younger, I used to watch, I don't know if you've ever seen it, um, House. Have you seen House? I don't believe so. I'm going to just... MD, um, House MD, I think it's called. Or MD House. House TV show. Yeah. House. So it's it's basically like a Sherlock Holmes, but a doctor. Okay. And... I recognise the dude. Yeah, Hugh Laurie. Yeah. And he's bit of a bit of a narcissist um he does whatever he wants he's um he doesn't really like people he knows he sees everybody's flaws and he's quite intelligent like he is intelligent like very intelligent um i remember for maybe a year or two just watching that character on screen, like maybe every day, I would just watch all of the house episodes, <clears throat> and once I finished the last season, I'd what rewatch it all again. Dude, if you're talking about TV people, then one hundred percent. Go on then. Uh oh, god, been through the motions of all of them. Um, I guess. Which is the one that sticks out like most? think i think this is really bad but probably lucas from one tree hill really yeah no, i haven't seen one tree hill so i have no context of who lucas is but the fact that it's one tree hill dude i i saw I, I still can't handle the fact that i can't manage to seem to get anyone in my life to watch one tree hill i've managed to get <laughs> claudia to watch it but um i think Wait, One Tree Hill, was that what you, you um Yes you sent Yes. Lucas is who? The the guy in the uh the un- underdog who's Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could um, I could see that. I can see that. I think I kind of like uh, I self fulfilled that prophecy in some weird ways as well. Well, that's what I was going to say. Uh, that's what yeah, I was going to say about it's interesting. Like, you grow into this idea of who you are, who you, you should be. You are at the end of the day. You're only the person you are is who you tell yourself. Yeah, exactly. You are when you wake up in the morning, and then I guess five percent of it is who, what other people tell themselves about you. Yeah, but they don't think about you very often, whereas you think about you all the time. Exactly. So your opinion really matters. Yeah, and I I grew up watching. One Tree Hill, um, and it was like my, I just remember being a kid, sat at this really small TV in, in my mum's room in the top right-hand corner, and everyone would be downstairs using one of the TVs, so I could watch in the evening up there on my own, just One Tree Hill, and I'd buy the DVDs online, and they'd arrive. 
whack them in and there'd be this exercise bike I could sit on and I'd just sit on this exercise bike pedaling, just watching um, this amazing storyline of just like this world where people are so kind to each other and so emotion means something mm. art means something like the words you say in conversation mean something they're not just filler conversation of you trying to forsake awkwardness and there's too much of that going around there's so much you know you walk past someone that you recognize and you go like, like hello raise your eyebrows like it, what even is that as an interaction it's almost like a salute to a soldier you're yeah. acknowledging the fact that you know someone that you'd be too scared to even look a family member in the eye and tell them that you love them. Like, I know. And that is the problem with us at the moment is we have this barrier of just, yeah, but growing up watching One Tree Hill, watching that, definitely always thinking like, uh, I just want, I don't know, I want there to be a romantic side to life. I want it to be real. So not necessarily wanting to be him, but wanting to live in his world. I think right. that was a big thing. Okay, okay. And then trying to style life around that and just realise that taking opportunities and fighting for your own piece of the land is kind of mandatory to make something good out of life and have a positive view on life. So if I, I don't know if you... I don't think I've ever spoke to you about this, but kind of leads on from this, which is my next question, my next topic. Um, when you were younger, just relatively younger, it can be at any point in your life, did you have like a strong idea of what you wanted to be? Like, did you have like... So I remember being in primary school, maybe year six what's that 11 maybe year five so 10 nine something like that age nine 10 11 something like that and i was quite like i had this strong idea that i wanted to be a pilot um a pilot or somebody that makes things but i didn't know what um did you have anything that you sort of, when you was young, you aspired to be or you thought that I would like to do that? When I'm older, I want to do blah. Uh, I wanted to be, I remember I used to run around saying that I was going to be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> um so I obviously wanted to be quite a lot of things to achieve that. I think I wanted to be like a salesman, a businessman, um, like never explaining what my business was really. I guess I'd always have ideas, but I can't remember any. Um, and then also wanting to be like an actor or so a musician. At, at what age so, did you like your, at what age did I mean, it might not have happened yet, and it might not have happened for me. Well, actually, I would like... I to... know when I started wanting to be an actor. Yeah, go on then. So, <laughs> we used to do this thing called Young Americans. Okay. Ollie did that. Did he? He did. Wow. We've got the DVD of it. I bet you do. I'm probably <laughs> in it somewhere. Um, set the scene. So, Young Americans is a thing where all these... Americans or people from around the world. You don't actually have to be American, but they train in America in a school or something that you paid you pay to be a young American, I think, essentially. And it's like an art school and you learn routines and then you go to Japan or England or somewhere on tour. You turn up at schools and you teach kids to do these routines and then perform it to their parents. And it's all about like unlocking the kids' potential and believing in yourself and stuff like that. It's quite one tree hilly in a way in their uh, approach to things. And um, I guess it's quite funny, actually, because, you know, I say One Tree Hill and all that stuff doesn't exist. But if you met one of the young American people, they are really like that. They're like a campfire buddy friend that's just like, oh, yeah, you girl pal. Yeah. Like, and they are kind of like that. And then one thing that was kind of peculiar is that um, there was a girl who was doing it and... There was also my mate as well, Toby, 
and uh, Toby, you know, Tabena, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he was like, dude, you can sing. Like, you should, you should do a, a, a song. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 it's, it's fine, it's fine. He's like, dude, you should do it, you should do it. And then he told this this blonde girl um, to do this thing, yeah, uh, to get me to sing. So um, basically the way that you had to get a part was we'd all be in a room and everyone would be like jamming and people would just stand up and take it in turns to sing. Yeah. And like, dude, that was just horrendous for me. Like my legs would be wobbling and Jeez. everything. Like, and I think some people just like, mm, it's my vibe. I'm going to sing a song mm. and they love it. And there's people who can't sing who are also like that as well. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't think I'm an amazing singer, but I think I can sing. And I think especially when I was younger, I could sing a lot better than I can now. Yeah. And, um, so I stood up and sang, but only because Toby and her had taken me in a room before and Pripped like she, up. she'd like been like, just do it, do it, like getting me to sing, yeah. Amping you up. Yeah, exactly. Um and then something really weird happened after that, which was that um this American girl started like kind of like flirting with me, and then we ended up like seeing each other, okay. Which was a bit weird because I was like I don't know, 15 maybe. I think she was like 17 or something. I don't know. Okay. But it was a really weird thing because obviously at school, people knew about this, but they were kind of like teachers, but weren't teachers, obviously. Yeah. They were looked up to as like responsible people in a way. Yeah. Yeah. But this was also at a time in my life that was quite difficult because I had a lot of pain in my head and everything from my parents divorcing. Yeah. And um. And then I did this performance where I was like, I'm singing. This girl has told me to sing. She came from America and she made me sing. Yeah. And then I was just like, dude, that's it. I want to do Young Americans. I want to um, be singing. Yeah. Yeah. I want to do this. This is amazing. So I went to apply for Young Americans and I just kind of like chickened out eventually and didn't do it because I was like, oh, no, I don't think I actually want to go to America. But I did from then onwards want to do drama and I started doing things like the school musicals. Um, See, and that was like something that actually set me off doing what I've, I'm freaking doing. Yeah. I guess Miyako is setting off what, I'm, what I actually did in my career, but setting off what I wanted to do was definitely that. That's nothing to do with me, really. So um, I think this goes back to I think this was a very good example of what our our listener wanted to to know um which was like a tiny moment will shift a person's direction or maybe not shift their direction um but at least provide a, a pathway for somebody to go down in life because I, th- I think um, that's something that I said a few episodes ago as well, which is a lot of people don't have like a clear path of wh- what they want to do. Um, but for you, that seemed like the thing that was, it gave you, it, you, maybe you didn't have a have a path before that. It was just like a fog of what to do in the world. But then this um, Toby and this girl sort of, put you on a path yeah and i think everybody has those kind of those pivotal moments in their life as you're growing up in your years age five to 18 there are certain points in everybody's timeline that puts you on a different path or opens up a new pathway for you to go down and you just have to choose whether you want to go down there or not and it's those decisions that make people who they are i think i think it makes sense did you ever have pokemon cards i did i used to collect them quite a lot i had a oh geez what did i have i had a level 100 ah uh, the maxed out bulbasaur Who's, really? What's the maxed out Bulbasaur called? Uh, is it Bulb something? Golden. It was Golden Card. Maxed out Bulbasaur. And I had a Golden... Is it Mat- 
Machamp. Oh, okay. Yeah. Golden. That was golden as well. Or shiny. It was at least shiny. Um. Venusaur. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's what it goes into. Ivasaur than a Venusaur. Yeah. I used to love it. I think I've yeah. still got some somewhere. They're oh no, I think Ollie spilt milk on them, so they all got stuck together. Might be worth having a look at them though. Uh, did you have them? Uh, I did. I don't have them anymore, but they were worth a lot of money in the end. Yeah, I bet they are. But I actually think it's a really good game. I was, I, do you know what? I've um, I've started watching it with Miyako sometimes, which is kind of like I have to navigate like a lot of it because a lot of it's like all of a sudden they're just like. Fighting. Okay, let's fight each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's another thing with kids TV is there's a lot of that where they're just all of a sudden like, okay, and let's kill each other. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, fuck. Jesus. Like, okay, let's not watch this. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to ask you because I have fond memories of it. Um, I remember once outside, I used to go to the cathedral church uh, in in Brentwood when I was like growing up every so often. And I remember once outside afterwards, we were all like talking about our Pokemon cards and this older kid like swapped like a crap Pokemon for my like shiny, amazing thing. Oh, and I remember I, uh, like my brother saw this happen. Yeah. And then I went and told my mum afterwards and I was like crying. I was like, because uh, my brother told me it wasn't good yet. And I was like, uh, I don't think this one's very good. Uh, and, and then uh, she was like, "Which kid was it?" And then she went and found him. She was like, "You give him that Pokemon card back." Uh, yes. <laughs> and then uh, I got the Pokemon card back. I tell you what else, actually. So um, it's Christmas Day one day, and I've been given a remote control car. Yeah. And in Edward's Way, the road near yours, with the field, all of the kids on Christmas Day would come out, and we'd be like present time do you know what i mean there'd be kites in the sky some kid would be flying with a what, super you, what world are you living in like this is trust me edward's way was where it was at okay no, I I, even when we watched the world cup like all the kids would be running around with like english flags like it was a little bit of a, a world of its own um but anyway so i go outside with my remote control car and i'm quite young in the group and there's this kid called matt and he's ginger and he's got a super soaker gun all right. Oh, jeez. He looks down at me. And one thing they used to always say is, oh, give us a go. Give us a go. Give That's us a one go. thing I like. Yeah. Not, 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 can I ever go like, oh, oh give us a give go. Us go. Give us a go. Give, give, give us a go. Give us a yeah. go. <laughs> give us a little bit of a go on that, would you? <laughs> and it's really weird, isn't it? Like, give <laughs> us a go. Like, especially with, like, just to clarify people, when they say us, they're talking about a singular person themselves. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I will not give us a go. So I didn't. <laughs> um, and he's like, oh, uh, I, I wonder if it's waterproof. And I was like, uh, oh, God. Uh, little kid, like, I don't know, maybe. maybe. And I'm like, driving my car around, like, just survive it, just survive it. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so he squirted my, uh, squirted my car, didn't he? And, uh, like that so then i uh obviously what did i do went to my mum perfect it's like mum look at this car you've only gone and bought me a car that's not waterproof no i wouldn't have been like that but i would have been like oh yeah this has happened next day i'm at toys r us She's at the till, and I'm stood there looking up at her, and I've now got a better toy car. <laughs> and she doesn't even, like, pay for it. Like, she just goes back and just rinses them. And, like, that was always a common theme in my life is, like, always Mom learning. Mum saving the day. She would just, like, set the, set the standard for service, for um for returns like there are loads of times man like sometimes the product would be priced wrong like i was in all saints once and a coat that was obviously meant to be priced like for 400 quid was priced for 40 quid yeah, yeah. and uh she uh the the lady was like oh um let me just have a little look at this and uh they, they got all flustered basically and they tried to say that it was wrong and then my mum was like no all of them on the rack are labelled at 40 quid. I yep. will be having one. 
I'm tempted to buy all of them, she said. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she bought it. And not only that, but I've been getting two T-shirts as well. And during the commotion of them scanning it, um, they only scanned one of them. So my mum went out and she said to me all about, like, we were laughing about how this had happened. Because I only had £100 for my budget for, for my birthday from her. Mate, you was winning. And I'd managed to stretch this hundred pounds into a coat, two t-shirts, a pair of jeans, and I still had twenty-five quid left over Jesus. to try and find a game or something. Um, but I said to her about the t-shirt, and then we were laughing about that as well. So uh, yeah, she did. She does good. Yeah. Do you I... think you should complain at a restaurant if service isn't good? Oh, um... I guess it's just what it means to you in life. It really depends. Um, how much the bill is at the end? Yeah, if it's like a ridiculous amount, like you should expect like a good service, regardless of what is going on. Because I was gonna say like if it's a if they look overworked, then maybe you should just suck it up and go. But like th there's a minimum standard at which if that minimum standard isn't reached, I would say something. But like. I expect my food to be warm, like hot, when I eat it. Mm. If it if I've been waiting an hour and then it doesn't come. I tell you what, here's a story. Um I went to Blackpool with my nan. I was young, maybe thirteen years old. And it was in this hotel. And it was just me and her because I think Ollie managed to get get somewhere that was really cool and I was complaining. So she took me there to Blackpool, not the greatest of places to take a young child. Um, anyway, it was good fun. It was really good fun. Um, and we went down to the restaurant and they sat us behind a like a almost like a fireplace, but it was like a pillar. And we were sat there for like two hours waiting for a service. <laughs> and then when yeah. we did get service, we ordered our food. And again, it was like another hour of like waiting for our food. And the people that we were sitting with eventually were just like, look, I'm just, like, I'm going. Like if our food comes, just say they've gone. Like take it back to the kitchen. We're going somewhere else. And eventually we got our food. But um, my, my nan was just like, look, I'm not paying for this. I'm not paying for this food because it was cold when it got to us and you didn't service us for three hours. We've been sat in this place for four hours. You know, it's like, I don't know. I don't care where you're going to recoup the cost, but I'm, I'm going out. I'm walking out. Um, and I've got also got a story about a remote control car. So right. I was living in Onga. This one's a bit more brutal than your one. But it's a similar story. Um, we lived on like a... a oh, wait, can I guess it? Is that ruining it? <laughs> yeah, I think it's That's ruining it. That's completely ruining it. All right, okay. Yeah. I've got a picture in my head of what this story is. Okay. okay. And I'll, 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 I'll confirm afterwards if it's it. Okay. Just so, from just from the, when, when you said it's a busy... Go, 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 go. All right. So <laughs> we lived... Before we lived in this house, we lived in Onga. And it was like a bigger estate, like a residential estate than Edwards Way, like a lot bigger than that. Um, and parts of our road were okay, but there was a section of this estate where essentially assholes lived. Like they were, they were, their kids were a shambles. And if they're listening to this, if they ever find this, you are fucking cunts, a lot of you. Um, and I'll fight you now. Anyway, I went, me, I don't know if I was with my brother or not, but maybe I was on my own. There was a school just around the corner and they had like a little car park. Um, I need to, I, I was similar position. I think it was after my birthday or after Christmas and I'd got this crappy little remote control car. And there were these boys over there as well. After I'd got there, I was at the car park, just zoom, zoom, like 
doing you know skits with the RC car and flying around, blah blah blah. blah. And these kids come over. They were probably four or five years older than me, two of them. And I was doing like laps of this car park, and they stood in a place where it was like where that the car would go as I was driving it around. And this kid just grabbed the car as I was driving around. He picked it up and held it in the air and just threw it on the floor and just smashed it to bits and laughed about it. I was like, why did you do that? Just like, no, it's funny, isn't it? And his mate was laughing. Stayed with you for life. Yeah. Fucking arsehole. Yeah, I mean, like... Like, you know what? If I was I in power, yeah. if I was in power, if I had, like, the power to be president or prime minister, I would say that, like, that incident, he deserves to die for that. <laughs> he does. Oh, he is a kid, though. No, 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 no. no. There's no, nothing. Well, him and his parents <laughs> should be killed for that. Oh, wow. A whole new level just got found there. <laughs> people like that don't deserve to live in this world. We'll be a lot better off if those people didn't survive. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's a perpetuating problem a lot of the time. Parents and kids. Bullies. Yeah, you bully your kids. The kids bully other people. Exactly. And... Yeah. <sighs> Poor Poor remote control car. Well, that wasn't actually what I thought it was going to be. I thought that it was going to get run over by a truck. I think that might have happened on the second one that I got. (laughs) 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 Oh, Oh, dear me. That's mad. I was thinking what a good podcast it would be if... uh, Every time we tried to talk about something or you said you had a story, I just said, oh, uh, is it this? <laughs> <laughs> the podcast no one wants. No. Um, yeah. But going back to deliveries, I once had a skateboard delivered by Argos. And um, so the very next week I was driving, like, well, I wasn't driving my skateboard, I was skating it. And I left it, like, on the edge of a curb on the square. Mm. And uh, <laughs> oh no! I think I went into someone's garden or something for like two minutes because like we were getting a ball or something. And I came back, and this is like a week later, completely different. Okay, not 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 the same time that it just been delivered. And I just saw it was broken in half. And then um, up the road, I just saw a big Argos fan just driving down down the road. So as in Argos had delivered me a skateboard, and a week later, just. Driven over it. Oh. These are traumatic things for kids to go through. They are. And uh, they 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 change you. Like these little interactions, they change you, man. But then I don't know if we're so precious because like what? Like there's so many levels to which a life can be traumatic for a child. And As like, you go through life, you like at the start of your childhood you you think that everything is like you're you're in like a bubble like bubble wrap and then as you get yeah. interaction from the outside you slowly start to realize that you're surviving like it's a world of survival not as bliss and comfort comfortable as you thought it was as a child Parents do a good job of protecting their children. But as the child slowly learns about things like bullies and stuff, that bubble starts to look very transparent and slowly just pops. Yeah, people are poking holes in it. So yeah. let me just rabbit hole this. So I took at around five o'clock, I took Miyako for a walk. We go for a walk at night sometimes and it's like a big treat for her because it's dark and everything. Yeah. So I walk up to normally the high street and we walk down the high street. Sometimes we get a hot chocolate and sit and look around or whatever. Or we go to the Sainsbury's or we do something, yeah. So we ended up at Sainsbury's. But on the way there, um, there's this wall that she always goes past. And I know that she likes walking on the wall. So 
I pick her up and I put her on the wall and I walk her along it and she jumps off at the end. And uh, I was thinking to myself at the time, I was like, you know what? Like that wall feels amazing to her right now. Like I just remembered when I was younger going on walls and I was like, yeah, lockdown's bad. But at the end of the day, like she can find happiness in these small things and you have to keep making sure she's exposed to these things. And I was like, I was like, I'm really glad that I took her on this walk just because that wall is still there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, and then she jumped off it, and she didn't have her wellies on. She had her trainers on, and it was wet outside, so there was, like, puddles forming on the pavement. Yeah. And I'm not sure if you've seen Peppa Pig, but basically they just, like, they encourage jumping in muddy puddles. Like, it's, like, just an activity that people do on a regular basis. Anyway. <laughs> and kids do that anyway, regardless. So she's just, like, running on into these puddles and jumping, yeah? Yeah. And, like, to start with, at the end of the day, and I was just like, I was in damage limitation mode, and I was thinking, well, if she gets really, really wet shoes and wet trousers, like, she's going to be freezing going through Sainsbury's, and, like, she is difficult sometimes when you shop. And when you're shopping, the last thing you want is a kid that's going, like, trailing oh, mud. I'm yeah. not moving, like, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you just want your kid to be, like, always, like, focused on achieving your goal of getting into the shop and, and out. out the other side. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully, like, you know, get them something nice so that they're happy. Yeah. She she got a small chocolate lolly today. Nice. Um, But even on the way there, after the wall, when she was jumping on the puddles, I was thinking, ah, you know, I should tell her not to. So I said, please, Miyako, don't jump in the puddles because you're going to get wet feet. And she's like, but I like it. I like Mm. jumping in the puddles. I don't mind. And I was like, all right. So I was like kind of walking her, holding her hand and like steering her to the edges of the puddle. So at least if she did jump in them, she it wasn't jumping in the centre where it would yeah. go all over her. That's the best bit though, jumping in the middle. I know, yeah. yeah. And uh, throughout the whole thing, it was like this dance of the puddles. But then eventually I was just like, just letting her go for it. And I was just like, do you know what? Like, I I, I surrender. Like, you have to be able to have fun as a kid. And I was like, just, just do it. Just jump in the puddle. So she jumped the whole way there in the puddles. She got back, changed her trousers. And that was it. And the obvious right decision, actually, was just to let her jump in the puddles and not to care, you know? Exactly. So uh, it's funny, though, because as a parent, you always, like, you always tell yourself, like, that you're great and that you make the right calls and stuff like that. But a lot of the time, you can do better. And uh, I think in that moment there, I was just like, oh, you can jump in puddles, and I was happy with it. But one thing I did think is in that moment where I was thinking it's fine to jump in puddles, I looked down at her and she was looking out at the world. You know, the street lamps were there. It was dark. It was wet. She's got her coat on. Her big daddy is this giant next to her because I'm quite tall. Yeah. And uh, she's just holding my hand being like dragged through, not dragged through the world, but, you know, like escorted through the world. And she's like, what? Not even three Can't foot even off jump the ground. In puddles. But she's three foot off the ground. And no, no, she was happy then because she can. But um, she's three foot off the ground. And I was like, I said to her, like, are you happy down there? Like, does it look nice? Like, what does the world look like? Like, are you happy? She's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, it's great. Like, I was like, what do you think of the world? She's like, it's amazing. Oh, wow. And then, um, and I was like, yeah, you know, it is. And then when you said about like that bubble that they have, you're right. Because like, so <laughs> sometimes I, I like, I'll take her back from nursery and I'll hear these stories about what these other kids are doing and stuff like that. Mm. Um and I just think, yeah, you're you're piercing the bubble. You're making it so that the kid is exposed to another. Like, oh, so we can people can hit each other, you know, or people can yeah. do these things. Like, yeah. um, I remember once uh, <laughs> we were in the car home from nursery, and she said something like, "Yeah, well, at nursery there's always a role of um, no hitting and no spitting," and. Uh, <laughs> I was just I just thought what? to myself, I was like, Jesus, what is going on? <laughs> um and, and then and then she's like, No, no hitting, no spitting, and no shouting in people's faces. And uh and she's like, but Layla likes to shout in people's faces. Yeah. <laughs> and uh and uh Every day we get a different story of, oh, well, this person did this and then this person did oh, this. Oh, that's like a whole world. And, and I just say to her, whenever anything happens, you go away and you do your own thing. And, like, when I look through the window, often I see her just in the corner, like, just sort of playing with something or whatever. Like, she's quite good at, like, getting away from it. Yeah. 
But um, at the end of the day, you have no idea. She might be out there every day scrapping away like on purpose, and she's the instigator. I don't think so, but well, it's but just weird that um, that bubble you talk about is definitely a thing. This is the thing, though. Like, um, the thing that I guess scares people to be parents. I know it kind of scares me a little bit to be a parent is everything that you say to that child is like affecting them. So when you said like, oh, uh, when, um, when something happens, you know, just keep yourself away from it. And I don't want you to think bad on yourself about what I'm going to say next, but, mm -hmm. um, that if she does that, what you're essentially teaching her is the flight response. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which could be saying to be passive and not to not to confront conflict yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, which is true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Um that's what scares me about being a parent is how do you know if the things you're telling the child well, is it's... what you like you know, the right thing. Yeah, but on the other side to that, there's the reward aspect of getting it right and i think it's 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 not just a scale of oh you're you're in a losing position you can never achieve successful parenting mm. like I, so i'd flip this on its head and i'd say so if you think of like your evening discussions with your dad yeah yeah um from what i see from the outside i think your dad's like a good role figure for both you and and ollie for like a man and a family man and, and what they should be like and how they should be. And just, just in general mannerisms and life views and stuff like that, you are quite all similar to him um, in the way you see the world. I think, mm. and I think a lot of your behaviors are learned through that and that sort of viewpoint, the schema of the world, the sketch pad that he has of what the world's like. I think it's kind of imprinted in ways, or at least the way the ability to think like that is, is inherited through you guys. Yeah. And then, so you, yeah, every conversation matters, but also these conversations can provoke. Um, obviously, you could you could question, oh, well, is that trait that he's given you a good thing? And you could probably argue, like for anything, you could argue a good or a bad argument for it. Oh, yeah, well, it's good true. in this situation, that's it's true. bad in this situation. But at the end of the day, it's it's a variant of of that's what it is. It's reproduction, isn't it? It's creating another version of yourself, basically. Yeah, and there will be things trying to teach it how to do things. Like when you see a monkey, yeah, yeah. a mum, a mum teaching a monkey how to hammer a nut out of the center of a, you know, with a stone or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's it, mate. That's it, mate. That's what it's about. That's what life's about. Parenting. That's what Passing it's about. on mannerisms as yeah. far as you can, and letting them pick up their own ones to pass on to their children. Yeah.